The case which I call the Narwhal Builder began for us in a very dramatic way. Holmes and I had just finished a late breakfast one morning, and we were talking in our sitting room in Baker Street. Holmes was about to open his morning newspaper when we heard a lot of noise outside. A moment later, someone was knocking at the door very hard. Then the door opened and a young man rushed in. His face was pale and his fair hair and his clothes were untidy. His blue eyes were frightened. He had obviously been running and he was breathing heavily. You have got to help me, Mr. Holmes. The police are following me. Oh, the scandal will break my poor mother's heart. Sit down, please. This is my friend and my helper, Dr. Watson. Please tell us about who you are. I am that most am unhappy that man, most John, unhappy. John Hector McFarlane. He obviously thought that we would recognize his name, but we did not. Mr. Holmes, if the police arrive, please make them wait. Don't let them arrest me until I have told you my story. Why do they want to arrest you? What crime they will charge you with? They will charge me with a murder, Mr. Holmes, but I haven't killed anyone. But I will be happy to go to prison if I know that Sherlock Holmes is investigating my case. Holmes is a tall, thin man with long fingers and a long neck. His eyes are like a furious bird's eyes. Now he looks very carefully at our visitor. I know that you are not married and that you are a lawyer. I know that your lines are not good, but I know nothing else about you and I don't recognize your name. I knew my friend's methods and I could understand what he was thinking. The man's clothes were untidy, see, so he was probably unmarried. We could see that there were legal papers in his pocket, so he was certainly a lawyer. We could hear his heavy breathing, so it was obviously that he had an illness of the lungs. Everything that Holmes had said was obvious, but the young man seemed surprised. That's amazing, but if you would open your newspaper this morning, you would have recognized my name. The man opened the newspaper, which Holmes had put on the table, and pointed dramatically to a headline. Then he held the paper up so we could both see it. Mysterious crime committed in Norwood. A well-known builder is missing. The police think that he has been murdered, and they are searching for a suspect. And I am the suspect. Your case sounds interesting. Watson, please read the newspaper article. I read what was in front of me. Mr. John Oldacre from the district of Norwood has disappeared. The police suspect that he has been murdered. Mr. Oldacre is a man in his 50s who has lived in Norwood on the southern edge of London for many years. He owns a building firm there. Recently, he seems to have stopped working as a builder, and he rarely meets anyone. Mr. Oldaker lives alone except for an elderly woman, who is his housekeeper. Yesterday evening, he was visited at home by Mr. John Hector McFarlane, a lawyer who works in Central London. Then, very early this morning, a fire was discovered in a timber store behind Mr. Oldaker's house. All the wood in the store was burnt, but when the firemen had put out the flames, no one could find Mr. Oldaker. He had not slept in his bed, and a safe which he kept in his bedroom has been opened. The police found some blood in the bedroom and they also found a heavy walking stick which belongs to Mr. McFarlane. There was some blood on the walking stick too. A door leading from Mr. Oldaker's 
pedal to the garden was open. There were some marks on the ground outside, it which led towards the timber store. The police think that something heavy was pulled across the garden towards the store. This morning, some strange pieces of burnt flesh were found among the burnt wood. The police do not know if the flesh is human, but they fear the worst. They are searching for Mr. McFarlane. They believe that he killed Mr. Oldacre and started the fire to burn his body. Inspector Lister of Scotland Yard is the policeman investigating the case. I'm surprised that you haven't been arrested already, Mr. McFarlane. I haven't been to my office this morning, and I haven't been to my home. It was very late when I left Mr. Oldacre last night. I live in Blackheath on the eastern edge of London. I wasn't able to get back there, so I stayed at a hotel in Norwood. This morning I saw the newspaper and I read about Mr. Oldacre's disappearance. And I read that the police were searching for me. I decided to come straight here to consult you. I think that the police were following me when I turned into Baker Street. Please help me, Mr. Holmes. I need to protect my mother from a scandal. At that moment, there was more noise on the stairs outside, and our sitting room door was thrown open. Inspector Lister rushed into the room. There were two policemen behind him. Mr. John Hector McFarlane. I arrest you for the murder of Mr. Jonas Oldacre. Holmes does not think that Lister is a very good detective, but he is always polite to him. He has often helped Lister with cases which have puzzled the Scotland Yard detective. Lister, will you be kind enough to let Mr. McFarlane finish his story before you take him away? Half an hour is all we ask. Well, you have helped me in the past, Mr. Holmes. I'd like to help you now. I'll give you half an hour, but it won't help Mr. McFarlane. You know, the evidence against him is very strong. He will soon be on trial for murder. And you know what happens to murderers. Mr. Holmes, they are executed. This trait always reminded me of a bulldog. He was short and ugly, and he was always ready for a fight. But now, he sat down. He had decided to listen to the young lawyer's story. Yesterday afternoon, I had a visitor at my office near London Bridge Station. The man arrived at about 3 o'clock. I would never seen him before. He told me that his name was John Oldacre. He took from his pocket some pieces of paper on which he had written a draft of the will. He simply wanted me to write it out again in the correct legal way. I read it through his draft. It wasn't easy because his writing was very hard to read. But when I'd finished reading, I was very surprised. Mr. Oldacre wanted to leave all his money and everything he owned to me. Of course, I asked him why he wanted to do that. He didn't know me, and I didn't know him. He told me that he knew my parents many years ago, and although he no longer saw them, he wanted to please them. He'd asked people who knew me if I was an honest man. He'd heard the good thing about me, and he had no family on his own, so he thought that I should have his money after his death. What an interesting story. Did you agree to write the will? There was no reason for me to refuse. I thought that I was a very lucky man. Mr. Oldacre asked me to write the will straight away. He signed it and one of the clerks in my office was the witness and signed it too. He then asked me to visit him at his house in Norwood. He told me that he needed to show me some documents and he asked me to come after 9 o'clock last night. He also asked me not to tell my parents about the will yet. He wanted it to be a surprise for them. Have you got any proof of your story, Mr. McFarlane? The signed will is at my office, but I will show you Mr. Oldacre's draft. 
He took some pieces of paper from his pocket and gave them to Holmes. Holmes read them quickly and gave them to Lestrade. I agree with you about the writing. It's difficult to read. The draft was obviously written on the train, in two places. The writing is well. The writing is clear. I'd guess that those parts were written in stations. Then there are places where the writing is worse. Those parts were written when the train was moving. And there are places where the writing is even worse. It's very bad in there. Those parts were written when the train was crossing lots of points which were close together. Well, what can we say about the draft list train? It was obviously written on the train, which only stopped twice during the writer's journey, and you only find lots of points close together near the main London stations. So, the draft was written on express train between Norwood and London Bridge Station, which is near this young man's office. So, we can say that Mr. Old Acre didn't think about his will until he was traveling to Mr. McFarlane's office. That's very clever, Mr. Holmes. But it doesn't change the evidence against Mr. McFarlane. Well, please continue, Mr. McFarlane. When Mr. Oldcare had left my office, I sent a telegram to my parents in Blackheath. I told them that I was going to meet a client and that I was going to go home very late. I didn't tell them who my client was. Then in the evening, I went to Norwood and I arrived at Mr. Oldcare's house at about half past nine. The old housekeeper opened the door to me. Mr. Oldcare greeted me and he gave me some food. Then he took me into his bedroom because he wanted to talk about some business documents. They were in his safe, which was open. We talked about the documents for a long time and I helped my client seal some of them into envelopes with a wax seal. After our meeting, I couldn't find my walking stick, but Mr. Oldcare said, you will soon be here again, my younger friend. I will find it and keep it for you. When I left the house, he was alive and well. It was nearly midnight by then. It was too late for me to get to Blackheath, so I stayed in a hotel in Norwood. This morning, I saw the newspapers and read about the disappearance. As I told you, Mr. Holmes, I came straight here. And now, you must come with us, Mr. McFarlane. My men will take you to Scotland Yard. I shall return to Norwood and continue my investigation. But we already know what happened, don't we? You found out that Mr. Oldcare was going to leave you his money and you couldn't wait for him to die. You killed him and tried to burn his body. You are wrong and Mr. Holmes will prove it. When McFarlane had left the house with Lister's two policemen, Holmes spoke to the inspector. I shall probably come to Norwood myself later in the day, but I think I shall go to Blackheath first. Will you? Well, you must do what you want to do, Mr. Holmes. But I think that you are wasting your time on this case. McFarlane is guilty. It's obvious. He sounded sure about it. But I could tell that he wanted to know what was in Holmes' mind. And Holmes was not going to tell him. Will you go to Norwood yourself, Holmes? Yes, Watson. But as I told this trade, I shall first go to Blackheath. This is a very strange case. Why would someone do something really important? Something like a drafting a will, when he was sitting on a moving train. We have to ask ourselves that question. Why wasn't old Ecker more careful about drafting his will? It is because he didn't expect Mr. McFarlane ever to get his money. It's a puzzle, isn't it? And soon after that, he went out. It was evening when Holmes returned. I could see at once that he was not happy. Perhaps this trade is right after all. Watson, 
I went to Blackhead and I talked to McFarlane's mother. She told me that she knowed Jonas Oldacre long ago. He was a troubled man and I'm pleased that he is dead. She said, she told me that Old Acre had wanted to marry her when she was a young woman. She didn't know him well, but he was a rich man and she agreed to marry him. They became engaged, but then she found out that he was a wicked. She broke off the engagement and told him that she never wanted to see him again. After that, I married John's father. He was a born man, but he was a better man. She told me, she showed me a photograph of herself, which she had given Old Acre when they are engaged. It had a knife cut all over it. Old Acre had sent it back to her. On the day she married McFarlane's father, he told her that he had hit her forever. Mrs. McFarlane is quite sure that her son is not guilty of the murder. But she certainly hated Mr. Old Acre. Perhaps her son hated him too. So you think that Mr. McFarlane killed Old Acre because he behaved badly to his mother? Is that the truth of the case, Holmes? I'm sure that Lestrade will decide that is the truth when he's talked to Mrs. McFarlane. The evidence says that it might be the truth, but I can't believe it. I feel sure that someone else must have killed Old Acre. At the moment, I can't prove it. And Lestrade wants the young man to be executed. But I have discovered something strange. I went to Norwood after I'd been to Blackett. I saw McFarlane's walking stick with the blood on it and the blood in the bedroom. I saw the marks which led to Timber's toe. It was all as the newspaper article said. But I also saw Old Acre's bank records in the house. For the last year, he has been paying a large amount of money every month to someone called Mr. Corinas. I wonder who he is. I also talked to Old Acre's housekeeper. I'm sure that she knows more about the case than she has told the police. And I'm sure that she lied to me. Holmes played his violin for hours that evening. It helped him to think. He was trying to find answers to all the questions that he had about the case. But I could see that he was worried and unhappy. And he was even more worried the next morning when a telegram arrived. Don't waste any more time on the McFarlane case. A new evidence shows that he must be guilty. Listed. We must go to Norwood at once, Watson. When we arrived at Norwood, Lestrade was there with two other policemen. He was obviously feeling pleased with himself. I told you that you were wasting your time on this case, Mr. Holmes. Now I can prove it. Come with me. He took us to a corridor which led from the sitting room to the kitchen. There, high on the wall, he showed us a red mark, a blood stain. It was a fingerprint. It was a very clear fingerprint. Well, Mr. Holmes, you can't always be right. This time I was right and you were wrong. You know all about fingerprints and you know that every person has a different fingerprint. I'll prove that that is McFarlane's fingerprint. I'm sure that you will. For a moment, Lestrade looked surprised. Well, McFarlane had Mr. Old Acre blood on his hand when he left this print. The case is finished, Mr. Holmes. Is it? I wonder why your men didn't find the fingerprint today. Lestrade? They didn't search this corridor. It didn't seem important then. Holmes, who had looked serious and unhappy all morning, laughed suddenly. It's certainly important now. Watson and I are going to walk in the garden for a few minutes. 
and then we will look carefully at the upper floor of the house. We will see you later, Inspector. When we were walking in the garden, I asked why Holmes was suddenly feeling happier. The tradesmen didn't search the corridor yesterday. He told me as he paced up and down. But I searched it. I searched it very carefully. The fingerprint wasn't there yesterday. It arrived during the night while Mr. McFarlane was in prison. I think that I understand what has happened now. Paul Strait will be angry. We left the garden and we went into the house. We went upstairs where Holmes again paced up and down, but he was still looking cheerful. Well, it's time to finish this case, Watson. Holmes called down to Lestrade. There is some straw in a shed in the garden. I want one of your policemen to bring some of it here and ask the other one to bring a bucket of water up here too and please come up yourself. A few moments later, the five of us were standing in the upstairs corridor. There was a pile of straw on the floor. Next to it was a bucket of water. What are you going to do? He was obviously puzzled. Watson is going to start a small fire, Mr. Ed. Is this your idea of a joke, Mr. Holmes? This is not a joke, Mr. Ed. This is a very serious. There has been a wicked crime, and a man could be executed for murder. Now, when I tell you to shout, you must all shout, fire. Do you understand? I took some matches from my pocket and lit one. Then I threw the burning match into the pile of straw. A few moments later, it was alight, and the smell of burning straw was everywhere. Now, fire! fire. Again, fire. fire! Once again, fire! Fire! fire. Again, fire. fire! Once again, fire. fire! At first, nothing at all happened, but then, something very surprising happened. A door opened in the wall at the end of the corridor. No one could have guessed that there was a door there. It had no handle or lock on the outside and just looked like part of the wall. A moment later, a frightened old man ran out of the door towards us. He looked like a rabbit running from its hole. Holmes caught him as he tried to run past us. Throw the water on the straw now, Watson. Inspector Lestrade, this is Mr. Jonas Oldacre. I think that you want to talk with him. He's been hiding in the little room behind the door all the time that you have been in the house. The old man had unpleasant face, gray eyes, and white hair. He looked worried, but he tried to laugh. It was a joke. It was a joke. It was just a joke. Don't be so serious about it. An innocent man was almost executed because of your joke? He told the two policemen to take the old man downstairs. I'll talk to him later. Well, Mr. Holmes, you have saved the life of an innocent man. It's the best thing you have done yet. What was the clue that told you that the old builder was still alive? And where did the blood stains come from? I searched the downstairs corridor yesterday. The fingerprint wasn't there then. Someone put it there in the night. I guessed that old Acre himself had done it. Obviously, the housekeeper was a part of old Acre's plan. She must have helped him. The small amount of blood in the bedroom is old Acre's own blood, I think. He must have cut his finger. The housekeeper must have hidden Mr. McFarlane's walking stick when he came here, so that he had to leave without it. Later, they put some blood on that too. Do you remember that Mr. McFarlane told us he helped Old Acre to see some envelopes? I think that the old man made sure that Old Acre pressed 
his finger into the hot wax. Then all the actors made an impression of the impression with more wax. If you understand me, last night he used that impression and his own blood to make the fingerprint on the wall. It was a perfect copy of one of McFarlane's fingerprints. Mr. Jonas Old Acre is a very clever and very wicked old man. This trade. And now, did you know about the hidden room? I know that John's old acre must be hiding in the house. So first, I measured the outside of the house. I measured it when I was pacing in the garden with Watson. Then, I measured the upstairs corridor. In the same way, it was shorter than it should have been. So, I guessed that there was a hidden room at the end of it. It was an easy thing for Belda, like Old Acre, to make. A few minutes later, we were all downstairs again. Old Acre was still trying to tell us that he had only wanted to play a joke on young Mac Fallon. Oh no, it wasn't a joke, Mr. Old Acre. Your building firm has done badly in the last few years. You owe money to a lot of people. Your creditors. You wanted to disappear and escape from them. This year, you have paid a lot of money to someone called Corylus. I'm sure that you are really Corylus yourself. You plan to disappear and start your life again as Mr. Corylus in a different part of England. Your housekeeper was planning to go with you. And of course, you have hated Mrs. McFarlane for 30 years because she refused to marry you. So, you decided to take revenge on her. You wanted her son to be executed. That's a serious crime, not a joke. I'll take revenge on you for this, Sherlock Holmes. That will be difficult when you are in prison. I'm glad to have helped you, Miss Trade. Come on, Watson, we must leave now. As we left the house, I asked Holmes about the remains in the burnt timber store, the pieces of burnt flesh. I expect there were rabbits, Watson. We can never prove it. But when you write about this case, you can say that they were rabbits. They